morning, Bridge family. So good to see you. Uh, you have survived the uh, time change. So welcome to church this morning. Are you glad you're at church today? Yeah, yeah, man. Hey, good morning, Columbia. Good morning, Coffee House Venue. We're so glad that you're here. If I haven't met you, my name's Chris. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it is an honor for me to lead us in our time in the Word. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it open to Matthew chapter 6. We'll start there, and we'll look there for a few minutes, and then we'll come back to it at the end. In the middle of the sermon, we're going to look at Luke 12, and so you can turn there and kind of hold your place. We'll get there here in just a little while. Uh, we're in a series that we've just been calling Upside Down Kingdom. In fact, today's the last installment of that series. And the idea for this whole series has just been around the concept that Jesus didn't just come as a good teacher or a great prophet who came to teach some nice things or help a few people. Jesus came as a revolutionary who literally would teach things that would usher in a new kingdom that would literally turn the world upside down. And so over the last five weeks together, we've just been talking about uh, what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And to do that, we've been looking at Jesus' most famous teaching. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In fact, uh, the reason we call it Upside Down Kingdom, this series, is because one theologian called the Sermon on the Mount the manifesto of the Upside Down Kingdom. And so we've just been talking about what it looks like, when, uh, uh, what a heart looks like when that heart is in the kingdom of God. And so today, um, we're going to talk about what a person in the upside down kingdom looks like when that person handles their money God's way. All right, we're, we're going to talk about money today, okay? And so maybe you're like, oh my gosh, another church talking about money. Or man, I came for the first time today and this is what we're going to talk about. Or, you know, I invited a friend. Oh my gosh, is, uh, you know, and so you're feeling tension right now. And if so, I understand completely, okay? I know why you're skeptical because I've seen that guy too, that guy on TV with the PhD. The Pentecostal hairdo, who, uh, who asked you to stretch your, that's funny, I don't care who you are right there, that's funny, <laughs> who asked you to stretch your hand to the screen and, you know, um, send in your seed money of $1,000 or whatever it is, and somehow God will miraculously bestow on you uh, millions of dollars or whatever the thing is. And then that guy, you know, takes your money and he rolls in in his $5,000 suit uh, in his Ferrari or whatever, and uh, he's taking things from you, and that's what you're afraid of. And if that's true, I, I, I just want to put your mind at ease. Um, we're talking about this today not because we want anything from you, okay? We don't want anything from you. We're talking about this today because, first of all, the Bible talks more about money than it does about heaven, hell, and sex combined. Um, there are over 800 texts in the Bible about finances. And the reason why is because um, finances and money is one of the greatest stressors in our lives. We, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. We want you to be free from that stress. And you have felt that stress before. In fact, um, a, uh, a CBS News study several years ago said that the number one stressor the number one stressor of Americans is related to finances. Um, what statistics say is that, uh, that uh, uh, the average American has their debt to income ratio is 136%. In other words, their debt is 136% of their income. That's the average household in America. Um, the average person by the time they're 28 years old has over $70,000 of debt. 55% uh, of American statistics say live from paycheck to paycheck. And if you're part of that 55%, what you know is every time that paycheck comes in or hasn't come in yet, but the money has run out, you feel stress, right? And what the Bible, the reason the Bible talks so much about money is that the Bible doesn't want that for you. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. Every one of us has felt that stress. In fact, here's the way Jesus described it in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Now that word's important. I'm going to read the rest of the verse. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This word serve is really interesting in the original language. Um, in, in the Greek, which is the language of the New Testament, that word is the word duleo. That's an important word. It's used throughout the Bible several times, and it's specifically used to describe how slaves would relate to their masters. What the Bible's saying is that money has a way of having power over us. Like, like masters have power over their slaves, money has a way of having power over us. And you know that that's true if you've ever felt just bound and incredibly stressed over your finances. 
Money has power over us. In fact, let me show you this way. There's a book that came out several years ago called The Day America Told the Truth. And the authors did all this research, and what they discovered was, they, they asked the question, what would you do for $10 million? Now, how, how would you answer that question? Don't, don't answer it out loud, please, Columbia, don't answer it out loud. What, for $10 million, what would you do? And here were some of the staggering responses. 25% of the people surveyed said they would abandon their entire family for $10 million. And some of you are like, I'll sign up for that right now, all right? Um, all right. 23% said they would become a prostitute for a week. Can you believe that? Look at this one. 10% said they would withhold information that would let a murderer go free. Like hide your kids, hide your wife kind of stuff right here. Let a murderer go free. 7% said they would kill somebody for $10 million. Look at this one right here. 3% said they would give up their children for adoption on the spot. 3%. And some of you are like, listen, I'll pay you to take my children right now. Like, I don't, you know, you don't have to give me $10 million for that. The idea with this whole concept is that, and the whole idea for that book is that money has a way of being powerful over us. It, it just has this power. Jesus would take it to the next level at the end of this verse. Look at this. Jesus would say at the end of verse 24, Matthew 6, he would say, I'm going to read the whole verse again. No one can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, this is interesting because at face value, you see the word money, you go, okay, that, that makes sense. I've heard that phrase before, like that's nothing new. But there's a deeper meaning to really what Jesus is saying here. And if you look at it in the original language, you see it. Some of you already know it a little bit because you have a King James version of the Bible. And if you've ever seen this verse in the King James version and several other versions too, you know that that word money is actually, it's the word mammon in the King James. That's actually the word in Greek. They just repeated the word in some translations of the Bible. The word is mammon. It's the word, it's translated money here. That's significant because mammon, what's mammon? What does that even mean? I mean it sounds like some kind of food or what is, what is mammon? Mammon is actually a, the Syri, a, a Syrian god. And it's the Syrian God of riches. And what Jesus is saying by using that word here to describe this concept is he's saying money is powerful. It's like a, it's like has power over you like a master over a slave, but it's not just even that powerful. It has power over you almost like God would have power over you. And he's saying that some of you are bowing your hearts at the altar of the almighty dollar. That's what he's saying. In fact, Mark Twain recognized that. And here's what Mark Twain said. He said, some men worship rank, some worship heroes, some worship power, some worship God. And over these ideals, they dispute and cannot unite. But they all, every man, they all worship money. They all worship money. Almighty God has been replaced in our hearts by the power, the God of the almighty dollar. And listen, what the Bible is, is teaching us, and we'll see more today, is that when we bow down to that God in our lives, when we bow down to the almighty dollar like a slave in chains, we will be in shackles. And that's why Proverbs would say things like the slave, uh, the, the borrower is slave to the lender. The borrower's in chains. Money has a way of putting us in shackles, in chains, when we bow down to the God of money. And so what Luke does in Luke chapter 12, so if you're holding that place, you go ahead and turn there right now. In Luke chapter 12, what he does, uh, what Jesus does is he tells this story. It's a parable. And in this story, Jesus is going to show us the kind of the reasons in our hearts why we have a tendency to bow down to the almighty dollar. He's going to show us three things that our hearts really long for and hope to get in money by bowing down to that, that God, the God of money. Our hearts long for that money promises, but it, yet it can never deliver. We'll see those three things, and hopefully you'll be able to recognize some of these longings in your heart that you're looking for money to provide for you. So check it out, Luke chapter 12. Jesus says this. Well, the Bible says, and he told them a parable, that's Jesus, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? The rich man thought, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, uh, here's what I'll do. I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build larger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to my soul, soul, <laughs> I love the way he says that, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. 
The first thing that Luke's pointing us to, the first thing that he's saying that our hearts long for in money, but money can never provide, we see in this guy's story is security. We look for security in money, and this guy thought that too. He already had some stuff, but he thought, listen, not, these barns aren't big enough. I'm going to tear down those. I'm going to build larger barns because I need more for me to really feel secure, for me to really feel like I can just relax and rest and things are going to be okay in my life and I don't have to worry so much. I need more stuff. That's what this guy's thought. If I have more stuff, the worries in my life are going to be gone. And listen, when we bow down, to, when we view money as security in our lives, we are bowing down to the God of the almighty dollar. And many of us are doing that right now because what we've done is we've put our hope and our dependence in just having enough stuff to be okay. Uh, enough stuff for a rainy day. And listen, are you saying, Chris, that we shouldn't save? Of course not. We should be responsible in that way. But it can get disordered to the point that we put all of our hope for security in our finances. And Jesus addresses that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. He tells this little story, and look what he says. He says, look at the birds of the air. For they don't sow, they neither sow or reap, they neither gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He's pointing to the fact that God provides, our, it's God that provides our security. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And look, this is really interesting. And which of you, by being anxious, by, by looking for, being anxious when you don't have money, but when, when you do, you feel secure, which of you, by being anxious that I don't have enough stuff, can add a single hour to the span of his life. What Jesus is saying is it seems like you'll find your security in money. It seems like it can be found there, but it can't be. Money, having enough stuff, finding your security there, can't stop death. That's what he's saying. You can even add another hour to your life. Can't stop death. Can't stop tragedy from happening in your life. Can't stop uh, economic crisis that causes you to lose your stuff. Then what, Jesus is saying here? can't stop broken relationships, it will never provide the security that it promises and that you're looking for in it. It can't. It, will, it's, it won't do that. It can't do it. Steve Jobs, um, who used to be the, the, you know, was the former CEO of Apple, um, he, he realized this idea later in his life. Of course, he died much younger uh, th than it seemed he would. Uh, and, and so what he said near the end of his life was really interesting. I read an article about it this week. He said early in his life, he thought, if I can just get to this level of income, then I'll be secure. He thought he could insulate himself from most of life's problems. And he became one of the richest men, one of the most powerful men in the entire world. And near the end of his life, he, he said this. He said, if I could do it all over again, I would put my hope and my trust in something else other than money. Steve Jobs recognized that money could never provide the security that he'd hoped it would. It can't deliver. That's what the Bible's just told us. In fact, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, points us to that same idea. In Hebrews 13, he says, Keep your life free from the love of money, from thinking it can provide what you need. Just be content with what you have. For he said, I'll never leave you. This is God. I'll never leave you. He's our security. I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can, what, I will not fear. What can man do to me? He's saying, no matter what tragedy in my life occurs, my help is in Jesus. We don't trust in the security of money. We trust in the security that's found in a magnificent Savior. We don't trust in our savings. We trust in the God who saves. We don't trust in our, listen, we don't trust in our full pockets. We trust in the empty tomb. Amen. We trust in the empty tomb. That's what Hebrews is saying. So sometimes when we bow down to the God of money, the almighty dollar, we look for money to provide security. Only God can do that. We also look for money to provide this for us. Look, for money to provide satisfaction. Look at the second part of a verse we already read in Luke 12. Verse 19, look, it says, this guy that he thought, if I can just have more stuff, then finally I'll get to the point. Eventually, Hopefully, I'll get to the point where I can just relax, where I can eat, drink, and finally, finally, once and for all, I can be merry. We've thought that before, right? If I can just do, have this vacation or this car or upgrade my lifestyle to this, if I can just get to this, 
then I can finally be merry. Then I can finally relax. If I can just have these cars or, or this salary level or this degree of you know, amount in my 401k, then finally I can retire and move somewhere sunny and have people serve me drinks with umbrellas all day or whatever, right? Like if, if I can just this, then I'll really be happy. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about this this week and um, Vanessa and I were talking about the, our first house. And uh, it was, it was a, they, the church I served called it a missionary house. It was a church, a, a house that the church owned. I was the student pastor in those days. They owned this house and they had furnished it for missionaries that would come home on furlough. And missionaries would live there for two, three weeks at a time or whatever it is and then go back. And they decided for a little short season to help us get our feet on the ground, they would give us this house. So they furnished it and literally it was furnished with stuff people didn't want anymore. It was like, you don't want to take it to Goodwill? Let's bring it to the house and let one of our pastors have it. All right. It was that kind of thing. And so, I mean, it had old ratty couches and beds that were musty smelling and it was, it was, it was a very crappy little house, but it was a great blessing for us because it was our first house. And I remember it probably the, t- together, probably we didn't make twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 a year. I don't know. It, w- it wasn't much at all together. And I can remember one night in the dead of winter, the coldest night of the year, the heat went out. And so Vanessa and I are cuddled up in the, the bed with down jackets on, thermals, a toboggan or a beanie, depending on where you live, uh, where you're from. It was a toboggan on, freezing. And I remember thinking, we we're talking about it this week. I remember thinking, God. This is terrible. If we can just get to whatever, I don't remember what we said, but you, you've all been there, right? If we can just get, then all of this will be, and we'll be happy. We'll, we can eat, drink, and be merry. And what's interesting, and this is probably your story too, you look back on times like that when you felt that way compared to now, and certainly I, there are things that I find more joy in now. I've grown in my relationship with Jesus since then and whatever. I don't want to over-spiritualize it. But when it comes to material things, am I more happy now with more stuff, the stuff that I had hoped for back then, now that the Lord's allowed me to have some of those things? Am I more happy now than then? No, I'm not any more happy than I was back then. See, more stuff doesn't provide us more satisfaction. It just doesn't. It's like a God, it, it, this, it's, it, when you continue to feed it, it's a hungry God who continues to eat and he gets hungrier and hungrier and hungrier and just never, he's never satisfied, Right? If it's true that the more stuff you have, the more satisfied you are, the more happy you are, then it, what would also be true is that the richest people in the world are also the happiest people in the world. And you and I know that's not true. It doesn't take long to look at stories on the news or read you know, articles about actors in Hollywood or whatever to know that that's not true. In fact, Harvard Business School did a a research study about that several years ago, and they they conducted this study with 4,000 millionaires, and they asked these millionaires, are you happy? Some of them had hundreds of millions of dollars. They asked him, are you happy? The the study, the findings were, uh, were really interesting. You know what they said? 90% of the people, 90% of the 4,000 millionaires said they weren't happy. They asked them the question, so then what would make you happy? The findings were even more interesting. (laughs) What they said was, what will make us more happy? The overwhelming majority said, what will make us even more happy is more. In fact, a massive percentage, uh, more than 50% of the people said, what would make us happy? More, not just a little more. What would make us happy is 10 times more than we actually have. These are millionaires right? It never satisfies. It's a God who continues to eat and gets hungrier and hungrier and hungry. In fact, um, you see it in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. He was in his day, the richest man in the world, had anything that any of us would ever dream or hope for. And all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he's got all these riches and, and the whole book, it's fascinating if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, is, is basically him sitting back, sitting on his fat stacks of cash and all the stuff that he has and thinking about life. And so all throughout, he examines life and he says, is this worth it? Did this really find, help me find a hope and meaning and happiness? And in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, here's what um, Solomon said. He said, he who loves money will not be satisfied. 
You won't be satisfied with money, nor, uh, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is vanity. All throughout Ecclesiastes, he uses that word vanity over and over and over again. Basically, the word means pointless. He's saying hey, it's pointless to try to find your satisfaction in money. It just doesn't work. You, you know that that's true, right? But somehow still, we think, yeah, but just a little more, <laughs> right? We still bow our hearts at the altar uh, of the almighty dollar looking for satisfaction, don't we? And so that's the second thing. There's a, the third thing that our hearts long for and hope for are money, but money can't provide. It's this. It's significance. Significance. Did you notice in that text, that, that story in Luke chapter 12, that that guy talked about himself? He referred to himself nine times in four verses. Nine times in four verses. He said that they, did you notice, you pick it up, that they were his barns, they were his goods, they were his grains, It's his stuff. It's obvious that what he thought was that everything was his and that it made him significant. And so he said, when I get more stuff, I'll tear down my old barns and I'll build new barns so I can fit more stuff because more stuff equals more significance in my life. That's what he thought. And somehow my heart goes there too sometimes and so does yours. We just think that there's a a certain level of life, a certain level of significance and authority that comes from having more. Our hearts often think like this guy, if I have more, I'll be more, don't they? Um, Billy Graham, in his uh, autobiography, it's called Amazing Grace, he he wrote this story, told about this this time he was in the Caribbean doing one of his speaking tours, and he had lunch with the wealthiest man on the island that he was visiting. And so he he goes to this guy's house for lunch, and he says in his autobiography that he noticed this guy the entire time at lunch was about to break into tears. And he said, finally, he did. He finally broke into tears. And this is what he said. Dr. Graham writes this in his, his autobiography. He says, in, uh, he says that this guy said, I'm the most miserable man in the world. I have my private plane. I have my helicopters. I have everything I want to make my life happy, yet I'm miserable as hell. He didn't find his satisfaction or his significance in money. What's interesting is later in that story, Dr. Graham tells this story of how he left this guy's house. And as he was walking back to the cottage that he was staying in, he passed by a small Baptist church. And so he was intrigued. And so he just stopped in to talk to the pastor there. The pastor was a man who was also in his seventies, about the same age as the rich guy that he had just had lunch with. And as he learned his story, he realized that it was a guy who had for most of his life never been married, but for most of his life had taken care of his two invalid sisters. And this guy said to Dr. Graham, it was so interesting. He said, I don't have $2 to my name, but I'm the happiest man on this island. The story goes that Dr. Graham would then ask, as they're walking away, he would ask his wife, who's the richer man? Who's the more significant man? And the, it's a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. And what Dr. Graham's pointing to in telling that story is, that, is what you and I both know, but our hearts sometimes get misaligned. It's that our, our significance is not found in bowing down to the almighty dollar and having more stuff. Our significance is found by rooting our identity in Jesus. That's where our significance is found. In fact, Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, And he said to them, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life doesn't consist in the abundance of his possessions. Your identity, your value, your significance is not found in how much stuff you have. It's not. So transit, he says, so so Che, turn upside down the way you think you find significance. It, It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And so, so then how how do there's there's the three ways. That the three things that our hearts long for and hope for are money, but they can never provide. So how, how do we eradicate those idols in our hearts? How do we knock down those idols? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Here's what he says. This is so interesting what Jesus does here. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. If you read this entire verse, these entire two verses, in the original language, what you'll find is that what Jesus does is 
Uh, Jesus uses, it's, it's basically a play on words. In fact, he continues and he says, Where, don't store up for yourself treasures in heaven uh, store up for your, or on earth, but store up for yourself treasures in, heavens, in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. It's a play on words. And what Jesus is saying is that the actual phrase in the original language is treasure not for yourself treasures. Treasure not for yourself treasures, speaking of the treasures of, of this world. And he's pointing to this reversal of that idea that we often treasure treasures, but what he's saying is we often treasure treasures, but Jesus treasures you, so treasure Jesus. Do you see that? We often treasure treasures, but don't treasure treasures, treasure Jesus because Jesus treasures you. That's what he's saying. Now, now stop and think about that for a second. What is a treasure? A treasure is something that we long for, and when we find it, our hearts get lost in the beauty and the value of it. That's a treasure. When somebody finds a treasure, they will pay, they'll give anything to get it, right? Now, now here's the reality that Jesus is pointing to. Every treasure that we treasure that's on this earth is a treasure that requires us to give a little bit to get it. It requires us to die of ourselves, to die a little bit to get it. Treasures of this earth require us to die. But what this, these verses, what Jesus is saying in this crazy juxtaposition play on words is that every treasure on this earth may require us to die to get it. But Jesus is the only treasure that we can ever find who died to get us. That's what the Bible's saying. And, and, and the, listen, think about it. The reality is that Jesus had everything that we look for in money. Jesus had satisfaction, and Jesus had significance, and Jesus had the security of relationship with the Father and security of, of, of everything that heaven had, but all of that was stripped away from him. And on the cross, what Jesus did is he looked at you and me, and he said, you are my treasure, and I would rather die than not have my treasure with me. I will die so my treasure can be with me. And Bridge family, listen to me. That is good news. That is good news. And it's only through recognizing that reality and allowing the fact that Jesus gave all of his treasure up to come to find his real treasure, which is you, to track you down and to redeem you and to make you his own and to adopt you into his family. Only when you allow that to captivate your heart and you feel the weight of that, will you ever be able to break free from the God of money in your life? In fact, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter takes this to the next level. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. He says, But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's interesting. I'll come back to it. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. The Bible has just said that we're a people. If you're a Christian person, you're a people for his own possession. Um, in the original language, actually what it says is, you're a purchased possession. You're Jesus' purchased possession. And when you realize that Jesus laid down everything for you to purchase you, to possess you, to make you his treasure, that's when you'll be set free. And that's what Peter's saying. That's when you're set free. And listen, when you finally get this, it changes everything about your life. And some of you, you came to church today and you came to try to fix your marriage or try to find hope that you've never found before. And you thought, oh my gosh, we're talking about money. Well, listen, the application is the same. When you realize that Jesus gave up everything to have you as his treasure, it changes everything. That'll fix your marriage. That'll fix your, um, your, um, your, uh, any struggle that you have in your life. When you realize that Jesus... Gave up everything, all this treasure, to make you his treasure. Changes everything. In fact, it flows out of you in a very practical... There's, there's one major implication. When it comes to finances, one major implication of this text. It flows out in a very practical way. Look at this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, So the eyes... The, he, he, in, in the middle of this story in Matthew 6, Jesus tells this weird illustration of the eye, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Look, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? 
So he's talking about light and darkness and the eye and being healthy and what in the world does that mean? Uh, you, you can shed light on it, no pun intended, light on this story uh, if you realize what Jesus is really saying in the original language. See, in the original language, uh, the word healthy that we just read, he's talking about a healthy eye, a good eye. The word healthy or good, and when he's talking about eye, is a word with a double meaning. It can mean healthy, but it also means generous. And in this text where Jesus is talking about money, that's probably the better translation. He's saying, when the light of Christ, there's the word light, when the light of Christ shines in your life, it transforms you in a way that when you realize Jesus treasures you, you will loosen your grip on your treasures and you become incredibly generous. That's what the Bible has just said. And some of you have experienced that before. And so you, your grip on your treasures has been loosened. And you love to give because of what Jesus has done for you. Listen, what did Jesus do for you? He gave himself on the cross. That wasn't comfortable for him. Jesus gave sacrificially. Yet on, in the garden, when he was uh, bowing and praying so intensely, dreading the sacrifice that he was about to make, in his humanness, dreading that sacrifice, he prayed so hard and with such intensity that his capillaries burst and blood fro- flowed from his sweat glands. And he said, God, if this be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, remember, nevertheless, your will be done. Jesus paid this incredible sacrifice for us, yet he was willing to do it. And when you realize that Jesus is is your greatest treasure, and he becomes that when you realize that you're his greatest treasure, it flows out of you, and your response is naturally the same that Jesus was. I want to be generous sacrificially generous. This may hurt a little bit. I may not be able to get the car or upgrade the wardrobe or do the thing, but, I, but because of what Jesus has done for me, I'll be sacrificially generous. And in, listen, this is so amazing because in God's economy, this is the way he has, he's designed this thing to work so that when Jesus came pouring the treasures of, of heaven onto us through his son and what he did on the cross, when we come to him, we become dispensers of those treasures. That's the way it works in God's economy. In fact, I'll give you a story as we wrap this up today. I'll give you a story. Uh, I went to seminary in New Orleans, and there's this legendary story about a seminary professor named Dr. Wilton. Now, he wasn't a professor at New Orleans, but he would, at a seminary, but he would come there and lecture in, in classes over the weekend or doctoral seminars for the week or whatever it was. And there was this legendary story that went around about uh, one time when he came to campus and he had taught his class, and then that night, he and another professor were in a grocery store locally, and they're just getting some snacks for the week. And um, he said, he's walking around, and he noticed this family, uh, husband, wife, he thought, and, and their baby, and there was a cart, and in the shopping cart, there was only powdered donuts and a gallon of milk. And he said he just noticed it because it was odd. That's the only thing they had. And they looked like they were just really distraught, and they looked like they were poor and sad, and his heart just kind of broke for them. He saw him when he first walked in, continued to walk around the grocery store, get his stuff. And later he kind of saw him again. They passed by and his heart was just broken for them. And he went on around. He asked the other professor, do you, do you happen to know that family? No, no, I don't know them. He said to the guy, I don't know what's going on, but I just, the Lord just, I'm just burdened for them. Began to, to, to tear up a little thinking about this family. The Lord had just laid him on his heart. And so he comes around to check out and there's the family in the checkout line. So Dr. Wilton just feels compelled in that moment to give them something. So he takes his wallet out. He opens up his wallet. The only thing in his wallet is a $5 bill and a $100 bill. And he looks at it and he pulls one of them out, puts his wallet back in and touches the guy on the shoulder. He turns around and he says, Hey, you don't know me. But I just, I just saw your cart and I saw you guys walking and uh, you know, I just, for whatever reason, I just feel like I'm, I feel compelled to give you this right now. And so he took the $100 bill and he placed it in his hand. He said, look, don't, don't open your hand right now. Just put it in your pocket when you get outside. Uh, go, ahead and, go ahead and open it up, take a look at it. And he said, listen, the re- I want you to know, look at me in the eyes. He said, the reason I'm giving you this right now is because Jesus has given so much to me and I want you to feel the same grace and generosity that Jesus has given to me. And so I'm giving this as a gift 
to you. And I want you, I want to tell you that your hope can be found in Jesus. And he left it with that. The guy left, he left, never saw him again. And as the story goes, about 10 years later, Dr. Wilton comes back to New Orleans Seminary to preach graduation. There's a, in seminary, there's always a sermon at graduation. It's like the speech. And so Dr. Wilton stands up to preach the graduation, finishes up. He's standing down front at the end. And a man who's older than most seminary students walks up to him in his cap and gown. And he says, Dr. Wilton, you don't remember me. I, he's, Dr. Wilton's South African. So he recognized his accent. He said, I, but I remember you. I remember your accent. And he said, about 10 years ago, you walked up to me in a grocery store. And I was at my wit's end that day. I had no hope in my life. And you walked up to me in that grocery store and you handed me something that changed my life. And it wasn't the $100 bill. That was just a vehicle that his hope rode in. See, the story goes, this guy, he said, what you don't know about me is that that day, I was headed out that day to, we were, my whole family, we're gonna commit suicide. We found no hope. My two-year-old little boy's favorite meal was powdered donuts and milk. And so we spent every last dollar we had to give him his favorite meal before we were gonna go end our lives. And then you showed up and you handed me something that changed my life. It wasn't the hundred dollars. That, that, that showed me that there was some hope, but the real hope that I found was when you said you were giving that to me because Jesus had given you hope. And when you told me that, Jesus gave me hope that I'd never had before. And he said, today I graduated, I became a Christian a couple weeks later, and today I graduated from seminary. I'm going to be a pastor because what I want to do is I want to go show other people the hope that you gave me that day in Jesus. And British family, I just want you to imagine for just a second, what if we became, because of our just overwhelming gratitude for what Jesus has done for us, what if we became a church full of Dr. Wiltons, who everywhere we went, we were dispensers of God's grace through the way we serve, through our generosity, through the way we treat people. What if we were an entire church of Dr. Wiltons? Can you just imagine what that would say, moms and dads, to your kids about what it looks like to live in the upside down kingdom? Can you imagine what it would say to our community if we express that kind of overwhelming generosity? Jesus did it for us. Let's be a church who expresses that to the community around us. And God will do greater things in us than through us than we could ever ask or imagine. Let's be generous the way Jesus was generous to us. And I want to pray that into us right now. Can we do that? Father, thank you so much that you've given everything for us in your son. And thank you that in Jesus, we can have hope and we don't have to hope in things that never satisfy, like trying to find significance and, uh, and satisfaction and uh, security in our money and our resources. Those things are fleeting and they don't work. We can find our ultimate hope and satisfaction in you. And when we bow down to you, our magnificent savior, we recognize, oh father, that it changes everything. It turns our lives and our, the way we treat our money upside down. And so God, may we live our lives in a way that recognizes the generosity you've given to us. And Father, right now I pray for anybody in this room who may not have ever experienced um, the grace that you give, the, the, the magnificent generosity that you give through your son on the cross. And so God, I pray that they would bow their hearts before you, give you their lives and find freedom in you. God, thank you for the way you give to us. May we be people who reflect that everywhere we go. In Jesus' name. Amen.